next Monday will be Don Finley and Mark Wombo, Interloop Architects from Houston. Uh, in two weeks from Monday, we'll begin a week-long series of events co-sponsored by the Cervantes Institute. So on that Monday, the 10th of November, Stan Allen Lectures. Uh, on the Wednesday episode of that week will be Juan Herreros, uh, formerly Herreros and Avalos in Madrid, or Avalos and Herreros. Um, and in between that will be a conference uh, uh, panels uh, with some of our faculty, as well as Stan and Juan, uh, and also Dana Cuff from UCLA and Sam Jacob from FAT in London. So, uh, and then there's another lecture on Friday. So the week of the 10th, there's four events. Um, so just don't even go to class. <laughs> Uh, tonight, I'm very pleased to be able to welcome Paul Florin back to the School of Architecture. Uh, Paul, of course, is president of Florin Architects. Uh, he received his BA from Washington University in St. Louis before heading to London, where he received his uh, diploma degree from the Architectural Association and his RIBA Part 2. Uh, I guess they're not Part 3, so you can't practice in the UK. That's fine. Um, but he has a diploma from the AA. Uh, at a very interesting time in the AA's history, uh, in the mid to late 70s, when Alvin Boyarsky was the chairman at the AA, Alvin, who was formerly here at UIC. Um, but since the AA was clearly not enough, Paul came back and got his post professional master's degree here at UIC in 1982. Uh, so I'm very pleased to be able to introduce our first alumni in the series. Uh, Paul also taught here at the school regularly from 1982 to 1992, more or less, for a 10-year period. And so, along with Peter Eisman and Sanford Kunter, he joins uh, the list of lecturers this fall who were also former instructors um, at the school as part of our nostalgia kick. Um, in addition uh, to both his long teaching record and numerous local and national design awards, Paul's also operated, like many architects, especially earlier in their career, as a curator, a writer, instigator. Um, he co-invented, I guess, or co-founded the Violated Perfection show and curated that, which also happened here uh, in 1985 at UIC. Later, uh, that show became the book of the same name, Violated Perfection, edited by Aaron Betsky, uh, and famously stolen by Philip Johnson and company at MoMA reincarnated as the Deconstructivist Architecture Show in 1988, uh, which proves that in architecture no good idea goes unstolen. Um, so that's how you know you've made it, when your ideas have been stolen and broadcast louder by other people. Um, so, for whatever it's worth. Um, for the last two decades, Paul has really um, upset the bar extremely high for a practice in Chicago um, from work. From the level of uh, detail and resolution to really uh, concept and uh, imaginative uh, use of space and, in you know, particular, my interest, uh, kind of graphic sensibility, and makes that clear in recent projects like the Hyde Park, Hyde Park Bank Tech Center, um, uh, as well as many other uh, residential and commercial projects, which I think demonstrates really that. Paul's an anomaly. He's the only Chicago in the, on the lecture series this fall. But um, you know, it's also meant to indicate that Paul is Paul's work is in conversation with all of that other national and international uh, energy and discussion of advanced work in, in other circles. So um, you know, it's very happy to be able to have him in our town and so take advantage of him hopefully much more regularly than we have. Um, I have to say that despite all of Paul's many circuits and many travels in, um, I first ran back into Paul again when I arrived last year uh, at the Taylor. Uh, in fact, four times uh, at the Taylor, I have to confess. Um, if we, never, we never saw each other at any architectural event, but we keep running into each other, you know, sheepishly, like, oh, I'm sorry. You know, it's kind of embarrassing to find, run into somebody at the uh, Taylor. But I have to say, uh, I knew when I saw Paul there that I had found the right tower. <laughs> um, so then I knew I had arrived. Uh, in any case, please join me in welcoming the always witty, talented, smart, and very well tailored Paul Florio. <laughs> Tonight I'd like to present uh, some of the work of the firm, the collaborative practice of 
I'd like to focus, however, on the way that we as architects and designers sort of weave together the strands of our individual sensibilities with those of modernism. I believe that an understanding of the figural approach to design is essential because, firstly, all form and spatial sequences are articulate. They communicate messages which range from the universal to the particular. We have a responsibility as designers to understand and to tailor our built paragraphs to those whose lives they enhance. But one group finds sterile, another finds serene, but a stimulating design is disoriented to many. We are both the product and the makers of the coral reef that we inhabit. If we exclude the great coded strands that have created hit in us, we may fail to transcend your exercises in a theoretical fashion and form-making technologies. How do we as designers assimilate and transform our sense of things into something concrete in lieu of rigorous theoretical systems and, and procedures? How might this affect the selection and composition of the modernist canon? At what scale do we apply an idea? And at what point does an object or structure become to tenant? That is, when does it come to embody layers of meaning that carry the weight of myth or art beyond a generation? The search for elemental expression, ostensibly devoid of ornament, comprises the project of modernism, an attempt to create an architecture unencumbered by cultural history a fundamental infrastructure of infinite possibility. And this aesthetic and its many variants remain available to us through the filter of more recent attempts to justify formal expression, whether it be indexed or technically documented, ironical decoration or figurative form. As individuals, however, we continue to continue to embody the immediate past as well as the past folded within it, whether blended or marbled. And this past, perceived as the present, cannot be restricted to architectural vocabulary. Any ritual, story, pain or pleasure can animate the elemental state of the modern. And it may be at any scale, for, for example, an exhibit, a chair, or a high rise. Reductive geometrical forms typically convey a little to a lot of people. The ideals of equality, freedom, and accessibility may be read into simple volumes, repetitive structures, and continuous spaces without addressing specific cultural groups. A resonant ambiguity can result from the interplay of solid and void in a volume seen through the filter of urban and natural landscapes, as well as the eroded cube of such proto-modernists as Macintosh and Lowe's. Here are the L-shaped volumes of uh, four duplexes to create a building at Wilmot and four to this is built. An arbor penetrates forms and links the spaces of a house in Arizona. The house itself mediates a desert landscape and a lush park beyond. Emphasis on skeletal form, the column or the grid, may express airy elegance and, the un and universal applicability. The columns here of Chiasso, a lacy scaffolding, uh, evokes both the urban street and the support of universal contemporary objects. Randomly disposed poles and planes convey the idea of accessible technology at a digital communications store. The combined vocabulary of platonic solid, plane, and column comprises the full initial vocabulary of modernism. The asymmetrical disposition of these elements maybe applied at the scale of the door pole, 
or of a lamp table. The nuanced balance of classical modernism, restricted to the use of plane and volume, modulates the interior of this lakeshore drive apartment. Columnar forms are restricted here to strap like vertical cases and furniture which soften divisions and create emphasis at points of transition without eliminating corners. Lighting is recessed to create coffers and, and, some, and together with some atypical finishes make an oblique nod to a collection of rule on and secessionist furniture without integrating or competing with them. The Dustale formulation of modernism blurs the distinction between the wall, the roof, and the floor, the closed and the open. It permeates the plane over volume. The idea that a building is a frozen part of an infinite continuum of interlocking and partially mobile parts anticipates the trace, the documentation of formal location of elements without reference to the design process. The figure of an imaginary gate, city gate here, uh, inspires the interplay of volumes in a vase frame a chair on the left, and an exhibit in the Museum of Contemporary Art. It also inspires here the interior of a, a, of a house, a villa on a lake in New Jersey, or a painter in a commercial office building in Hyde Park. So to the uh, this the head of a colossus um, here on the right, by to inspire a series of. Uh, objects, an exhibit space, a branch bank, or a house of, for an urban intersection. The constructivist uh, introduction of a curved fragment and the, uh, the sort of uh, individual in conjunction with the loose plane and asymmetrical disposition, non orthogonal disposition, uh, inspires here a house overlooking Lake Superior. A cantilever dram and reflecting pool links the interior of the house curving to the horizon line of the lake. A spun fragment in, uh, of a steel organization might create a chair which double functions as a lamp. The same principle could be applied to create the asymmetrical glass volumes of a garden pavilion in the So to an imaginary city, I suggest a chair of stained birch. The figure of a bird god might inform rituals of dressing in a clothing store, a candlestick bookend, a throne of corrugated acrylic, or the wing, the wing shield of Wicker Park Home. Dynamic movement proposed by futurism urges the animated with the animate. For example, a mass goblet here on the left, and a goblet and a candlestick butt buzz in the spirit of my all and Brent Cousy. Also suggested to me. Uh, 
this street lamp was entered in competition with Queens. And it folded the plates. An emphasis on gesture um, and a certain empathy with movement called kinesthetics, suggested by uh, expressionism, can emerge in a costume on the left and become a door frame or a chair, become household objects of gesture, or the central uh, focal element of a house in the Gold Coast. Same impulse is evident in the sweep of this roof for a house overlooking the ravine. The integration of historic architectural embellishments can further particularize the meaning and the audience of the modern. Here, a decorative sensibility infiltrates the modern with the modern. Burden Place in Chicago. The patterning of industrial windows and sculpted curves of Mallory Stevens converge with the funky bricolage of the Chicago Arts and Crafts of Edgar Miller. An East Village edition is both con a contemporary riff on the Chicago bungalow and an architecturalized personality or mask. Inside, the light box obscures the corner of the living room to give the illusion that the windows wrap around uh, on the interior without compromising the vernacular expression of the exterior requires the corner. The L shapes of modernism, the trimmed and thickened slab of prairie style, and the hood of a 1960s Edsel converge in this 24 unit building on Ketsa. It's also built. Although architectural compositions only become pure, that is, come to be viewed as style rather than fashion as cultural consensus arises, an attempt to juxtapose distinct architectural vocabularies within a single project may result in a harmonic resonance. The excavation, restoration, and erasure of aspects of this baronial Victorian house interlocks inserted uh, modern materials and cabinetry and screens. We actually did a, a sort of a mid-century modern parlor screen in this one. Uh, all of this is an attempt to juxtapose distinct architectural vocabularies within a single project. The result is a setting for mid-century objects in art. The environment is, neutral, is not neutral but double voice. The oscillation of the modern and the historic creates ambience less universal than modernism and less particular than the traditional. The insertion of glowing contemporary land, a glowing contemporary landscape into the restored and relit banking hall of the Hyde Park Bank creates a different kind of friction, or a free song maybe be better. While contemporary forms are crisp, color and material and color and patterns refer to those of the hall. An acrylic stainless steel canopy diffuses light and reduces the scale of the space of the teller line. Contrast and weight, light, and color direct attention 
to the primary points of interface between customer and staff. Mesh and fritted glass partitions create one-way visibility at offices within the arcades and define a central space without comprising, uh, compromising the power of the travertine arches. The space altogether conveys two parallel messages simultaneously. The image of a contemporary service organization and that of an historic community institution. dense complexity of compound expressions when they are compressed into an ambiguous whole, which flickers between different meanings. The layered surfaces of this house, in the book room, I know it doesn't look like a house, but it is, um, balances the expression of volume and that of the column. An expression perfected sort of hyphenated periods from mannerism to the 1930s, from Hawksmoor to Libera. Both vocabularies are stripped down and merged into the pier, itself the fusion of the column and wall. I'm also drawn to the wrapped pier or strap ambiguous kind of form, solid to the side, open to the front, acknowledging no top or bottom. Not a box or plane, but a hybrid that shifts meaning as one moves around it, in which space is directed with the Here we have Art of the Edge. It's an exhibition for the Art Institute of Chicago. Some variants of, the, of this very condition. As you mean, to, uh, this whole idea of how you modulate the relationship between uh, the viewer and art and between real and imaginary space is what's uh, being explored here. On the right, you can see it's a, actually a, a series of telescoping frames uh, which document that relationship. Uh, and the, particularly the ones on the right, the front of the frames document the relationship uh, between the viewer and architecture. So something that could be a baseboard, could be a, a cornice in the, in the beginning, gradually becomes an object on a wall as you move down the line. The back of the frames all have to do with the relationship of the viewer uh, and of the art, of art being projected into the viewer's space or receiving. These strap-like elements um, also project messages of the high art gallery in, common, in parallel to, the, um, to that of the accessible warehouse, sort of warehouse sale uh, for a gallery in Sotheby's in Chicago. Expanded to the scale of a series of interlocking duplexes in the West Loop, the orientation of the strap adapts it adapts the building to contextual requirements for privacy and light, as well as the expression of the individual within a larger group. The strap can also express non-modernist notions of the applied facade and the cornice that engages the sky on the left. An almost complete bank facility here on Elson Avenue integrates the decorated and the figurative in a small but complex assembly. Here the billboard, the vine, and the strap coexist. The value of timely action and the command of numbers are expressed in the interior and the exterior as murals, the synthesis of ornament, the signage, and public art. These patterns are contained, however, they're all uh, really thought 
thought of as uh, formal elements rather than as camouflage. The mix of rough and uh, finished materials convey a sense of strength, the knowledge of essentials of construction, and contemporary insight. The white block of the enclosure is carved away at either end to create sunscreens on the southeast side and an atrium that's 30 feet high actually on the, on the front. Two final projects. First, uh, some alternate concepts for a boutique hotel in River North. Uh, these explore, to my mind, new opportunities afforded by the convergence of the figural image and contemporary technology. These images are, to me, at this point, potentially concrete. They're not images which inspire something else, but could be literally. architectural fact. All of these incorporate the same programmatic elements and lifestyle attributes. The tantalizing entry plaza, the overlapping semi-private lounges or clandestine rendezvous, the signature restaurant in the spot. And they must broadcast conflicting messages to the adventurous retreat urban epicenter, both accessible and exclusive. Finally, a project for uh, Mexico City. On the left, you can see uh, everyone in, in the office offering various ideas. They're all sketches from different hands. That, eventually emerged in this image on the right. These are two towers, the, pro the program is for two towers to celebrate Mexican independence. And I think, oops. Turbines are integrated into the folded 
edge of the cocoon shell. In conclusion, the fusion, the fusion of aspects of modernism is potent. Disparate theoretical strands, the self-documenting process, the expression of the tectonic, the figurative, and the decorative have been converging, combining, and recombining in concurrent channels. New technologies now make it possible to document, design, and construct forms unseen, if not unimagined. But another convergence is imminent with the within the territory of figuration itself. We now have the opportunity to re-envision architecture as actual art. New technology can produce more than self referential form. The expressive image can become both inspiration and fact, and the iconic will become the icon. Thank you very much. Well, they're, 
there's a there's a kind of uh, restlessness that can occur from a distance. I think the bank has some of that. It's the coloring materials that pattern and ties them together. Forms are totally separate. But when you start carving into an older house and inserting little pieces or adding things between spaces but restoring the crown, you get into a, an even more delicate uh, process. I mean, I think they're they're speaking to each other, but it's a it's a shorter way sound wave. Uh, so by double voice, I mean that you can you can hear both. If somebody was, it would be almost as if somebody was reading two stories to you simultaneously. But in your and they were joined in your mind rather than into some kind of coherent text. But they sort of make sense to you. As you experience them, and when the, the there's a different kind of when I was looking when you're looking at the, that um, that sort of 1930s Raj house that uh, has this uh, kind of fusion of this skeletal skeletal form and volumetric, where depending on how you're thinking of it or moving around it, it either is blocky or it's columnar. Um, but it's really a both and situation, not an either or. So it's not really a juxtaposition, it's this kind of an ambiguous fusion. I think that is a different kind of. I mean, maybe I wouldn't call that double voice, so I guess I would call that uh, a very complexly layered single voice. But then it's uh, a sort of paradoxical. Getting, you're getting a very rich, layered uh, kind of reading, which is both and situation. And compound expressions. That's the same. That's the same as the point, or the same as that complex symbol. Complex symbol. At least that's, you're helping me perfect the language. Yeah. Yes. Am I being interviewed? Actually, I go back and look at some of these 
sketches and other things like that, uh, and see what they what they can note and what's appropriate. Yeah. Um, in, in the first, the, the largest group of drawings are about lines, planes, boxes, and edges. And as the, they went along, this tension with curves, arcs, organic forms emerged. That, you know, for instance, in the Hyde Park Bank, the play between the the sort of planar elements uh, in the lighted walls or the canopies and those sweeping arches. And for the, you know, the sort of uh, curved uh, house on, on Lake Superior. And then, you know, going to this, which is almost Gaudi-esque in a, in a, in a way. Yes. And I, I guess I'm just wondering as think about your practice and the, the this tension between a sort of you know more mathematical forms planar linear with edges and more organic forms curvilinear um, arcing uh, almost self-consciously irrational the way nature is I, I guess I just wonder as you think forward the kind of work you're going to do, how you think about those tensions or those opportunities in your work, and, and which things most interest you as you go forward? I think the distinction is perhaps not. It's harder and harder to draw. I don't think you can really say that um, this simple geometric modernist vocabulary, even with the add-ons and uh, the introduction of the non-orthogonal, is really more uh, less or more ma mathematical than another kind of construct, which is fluid. So it's becoming harder and harder to tell the difference between what you might call organic or not. So I see it as part of one continuum. But my, my interest has always been in uh, juggling particular kinds of sculptural form. And I'm simply uh, more drawn to the, more, uh, to the vocabulary, vocabulary I know best. So I would say this is an, you know, this is an aberration, this is an experiment, and uh, very much driven by really trying to shake things up for myself, but also enjoying this idea of some kind of integrated fabric rather than always taking something to do and balancing it one way or another. Anything else? Thank you very much. Oh, Jeff? I think you're, I think I know what you're saying. I have a great interest in history and formalism. It's not necessarily part of the modernist. But I also, am, am, I like uh, reducing it to some kind of a, what I would call like iconic uh, expression. So it's always, you can start it all your own. Embellishing something which is by its nature very simple, or reduce stripping something down to the point which is almost new.